Hello, everyone. My name is Alex Dahl. I'm a grinding consultant based in Cork, Ireland. Today's presentation is talking about autogenous and semi-autogenous grinding systems, and it's prepared for the Vijay Ganaraya Sri Krishna Devaraya University in Bellary, India. The lecture notes for this presentation are available online. You can click the link down in the description and then download these notes yourselves and follow along as we carry on with the lecture. This presentation is intended for an audience of university students who are in a mineral processing program and have some familiarity with the basic concepts like particle size distributions and unit operations. The outline that we're going to go through is a discussion of mineral breakage and what goes on as we try to break minerals. We'll then talk about some of the autogenous and semi-autogenous grinding circuit types, the different ways you can arrange these grinding mills. I'll talk a bit about the design versus the optimization of these circuits. How you model certain things within a circuit can change depending whether you're in a design setting or in an, uh, an operation setting. I'll talk a bit about the ball mill power-based modeling as well as ag-sag population balance modeling, which is a different type of modeling that's usually used for uh, circuit optimization. I'll talk a little bit about operating a sag or an autogenous circuit, and then finish off with a summary of mill motors. So we'll start discussing tumbling mills. So tumbling mills are the class of equipment that consists of some sort of a a cylinder, it can be a long cylinder or a short cylinder, that is containing an ore that needs to be ground, usually also with a grinding media. An autogenous mill contains a charge that is nothing but the rock that you are actually grinding. It doesn't contain any other additives inside the charge of the mill. Basically, it's using the rocks to break other rocks. A semi-autogenous mill is similar to an ag mill, except that you've added some large steel balls. So these balls could be up to as much as 150 millimeters in diameter. Effectively, you think of them as cannonballs. And these cannonballs will then be rotated with the rotation of the mill and will be um, cast and impacting into the charge, breaking rocks as it goes. The discharge systems on mills can be a little different depending if you've got an autogenous mill, a sag mill, or a ball mill. Most of the autogenous and the sag mills use what's called a great discharge. You can see that in the photo. And uh, ball mills will typically use an overflow discharge. So they don't have a grate on the end. They simply fill up the mill with pulp until the pulp level reaches the trunnion where the pulp overflows out of the mill by gravity. There is a continuum of these types of mills in terms of how many balls you will find in the charge. Autogenous mills have no balls in them. As I described, it's basically rocks breaking other rocks. Ball mills are a mill that contains basically just balls with a few fine rocks sitting in the interstitial space between the balls. Sag mills are a rock continuous charge, like what you see in the photo, where there are balls interspersed among the, the rock charge. And then there's an intermediate state between sag milling and ball milling called bag milling. And that's barely autogenous grinding, where you've got a lot more balls and less of the coarse charge doing the autogenous or on or breakage. Where you are on this spectrum can dictate the type of mill that you're going to end up installing. Typically, ag mills are cheaper to run, but they're larger and have a higher capital cost. Bag mills are smaller with a lower capital cost, but they have a higher operating cost. And ball mills, for reasons that I won't get into, are only really applicable to material to feed below about one or two millimeters. It's not suited for really coarse particles. So before we get into a discussion of the milling equipment, let's just run through some of the mechanisms of breakage so that we can try and, and tune 
a particular mill type to a particular ore characteristic. So the ways that an ore can break are basically divided into three main categories. The coarsest category we would typically call either impact or crushing, and it involves very large particles being dropped from high distances as the mill tumbles. And those large rocks will either impact other rocks, breaking them, or they will hit against the charge breaking themselves. So there's both large grinding media type rock breaking other rocks, as well as the self breakage of large rocks breaking as they are being moved around in the charge. In an intermediate size class, you will have attrition happening where the grinding medium, this would be your grinding balls or your coarse particles, will trap other particles in between them as these large particles are moving within the charge of the mill. So once these particles, the small particles, get trapped between the large particles, they're going to end up being uh, compressed and, and probably broken in this space between the, the two much coarser particles. And again, the coarser particles, we're going to call that our grinding medium. The final type of breakage is abrasion, which generally happens as really fine material gets abraded off the surface of coarser particles. You don't end up with a lot of intermediate sized material as a result of abrasion. You typically have the coarse particles that you started with and some leftover dust that is generated as these coarse particles rub together and they break off the, the, the smaller particles. These particles that break off the surface of the coarse particles are usually the target size that you're trying to grind to. So the end state that you want is abrading particles into these really fine sizes, which can then be classified into your circuit product. So just to go over this again, you start out with coarse particles in a mill. Those coarse particles will have an impact breakage where they will break smaller particles, and the coarse particles themselves can also break at this coarse size. There's an intermediate size where particles get broken by other particles, but not by impact. It's, it's more of an attrition uh, mechanism. And then the final size that your, your particles will come from is abrasion, which is particles, again, rubbing together, squeezing off smallest particles off the surface of larger particles. The way people in industry usually represent the, the breakage as a function of particle size is using a breakage rate curve like this. This also goes by the name of a selection function. But what it shows is for particles of a specific size, the size is listed along the x-axis, what is the frequency at which these particles will break? And that's what's plotted on the y-axis. So the higher the value is, the more likely rocks are, are to break if they are in that size range. I've annotated on this chart where the three breakage mechanisms appear for ag and sag mills. So the, the, the specific line that represents the autogenous case is the 0% balls, which is the circles, which if you notice on the right-hand part of the, the graph is the lowest, so that the autogenous mills have the lowest breakage of the coarsest particles. But if you then look at the left side of the graph, you'll see that the, the autogenous case, the circles, have the highest breakage for smaller particles. So again, different machines are suited to doing a particular kind of grinding. And if you have an ore that is suited to not, do, uh, not require a lot of, of grinding energy in the coarse size, but it does require grinding energy in the fine size, then an autogenous mill could be a viable choice. Note that in the center of this chart, there's a space where it seems to be missing a breakage mechanism. There's this pronounced dip, and that's a characteristic of ag and sag mills, which is normally called the critical size. 
the critical size represents a size range of particles where the mill is just not efficient at breaking those particles. What often happens in high tonnage plants, you will um, spit out of the mill all of the coarse particles, including this size range where it doesn't break very effectively, and screen that out and recycle it to a cone crusher. Cone crushers are very efficient at breaking this size range, which makes it a good complement to an autogenous or a semi-autogenous mill, which is very efficient at basically every other size except this one. So this segues into how we arrange grinding circuits. Often you will have multiple mills in a circuit. You'll have a mill dealing with the coarse fractions. It, inter, uh, it generates an intermediate size, which then gets passed to a second mill that handles the finer grinding. And the grinding conditions in each one of the mills is best suited to that size range where it's supposed to be doing the grinding. So in the photo that I'm showing here, on the right-hand side, we have a sag mill. And then on the left side, there are two ball mills. So the sag mill takes the, the raw feed from the mine that is passed through a primary crusher. And the sag mill uh, generates about a one millimeter to two millimeter transfer size, which then gets passed over to the two ball mills. On the very left of the photo, up near the top, you can see there's a bunch of railings up there. That's where the hydrocyclones for the ball mills are sitting. And the hydrocyclones are what do the classification and, 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 and generate the closed circuit around the ball mill. The sag mill in this case is open circuit. So there's, uh, once material passes through the grates, it goes straight to the ball mills. It doesn't have this pebble recycle that I was describing earlier. This mill is, is too small to need a pebble recycle. This flow diagram shows the situation of a sag mill and a ball mill, where the sag mill is in closed circuit with a screen where the, the screen oversize, that, that critical size, those pebbles are recycled to back to the front end of the sag mill. The material that passes through the screen, that's your transfer size. It falls into a pump box where it is pumped into the hydrocyclone along with the discharge of the ball mill. So the ball mill discharge mixes with the sag mill discharge, the, the screened undersized material, and that gets fed to the cyclone where it's classified, and the finished product size comes out the cyclone overflow, and the oversized particles are recycled back into the ball mill for more grinding. In a typical circuit like this, you would see anywhere from about 5% to 25% circulating load around the sag mill, and anywhere from 200 to 400% circulating load around the ball mill. This circuit shows basically the same flow diagram, except that the screen oversize, the pebble fraction, that goes to a cone crusher. And the cone crusher product then gets returned back to the sag mill for more grinding. One of the characteristics of a sag mill is that it's very efficient at turning angular particles into round particles, breaking off lots of finished product size in the process. And a characteristic of cone crushers is that they're very efficient at turning round particles into angular particles. So that's one of the reasons why this synergy can dramatically increase the energy efficiency of the grinding circuit by making the sag mill more efficient by taking its rounded pebbles and turning them into angular broken pebbles. This is a variation on the sag mill ball mill circuit with pebble crushing where the crusher product gets transferred into the ball mill instead of being recycled back into the sag mill. Ordinarily, you wouldn't design a plant to do this. There, there are situations where you do choose to do that. But what ends up happening is you're taking load off of the sag mill by open circuiting it, and you're putting more load onto the ball mill. Now, ordinarily, you'll see this circuit as, um, as a deep bottlenecking process, and it's quite commonly done down in Chile, where people have coarsened 
the product size coming out of the ball mill, taking a load off the ball mill, and then they will recycle these crushed pebbles into the ball mill to put more load back onto it, freeing up space in the sag mill to increase the throughput into the circuit. So this SABC B circuit with the crushed pebbles going into the ball mill is not what you would normally design, but is often a de-bottlenecking strategy that operators will employ later in the mine lives. The simplest autogenous or semi-autogenous circuit is what's called a single stage SAG or AG circuit. In this circuit, the autogenous mill is in closed circuit with a hydrocyclone, and it may optionally also be in closed circuit with a pebble crusher. So in this circuit, the fresh feed comes into the SAG mill from the, second, or from the primary crusher. It passes down the length of the SAG mill, passes through the grates, and then it goes on to, usually it's a linear screen or it could be a trommel screen. The material that passes through that trommel screen is, is usually on the order of, of a few millimeters. The material that passes through goes into a pump box and then gets pumped up to a hydrocyclone. And finished product size, which could be something in the order of, of 100 micrometers to 200 micrometers, that gets taken out of the process as product. And the material that is still oversized, the cyclone sends that back into the ag or sag mill. If you have a mill where the pebbles are not properly being extracted, they will build up at the grate at the discharge end of the mill, and they'll end up blocking that grate. That's a condition we call damming. If you have a sag mill that is dammed, it's, it's a very constipated and uncomfortable mill, and that's not a good situation. You want to make sure that pebbles can get out of the mill and either be crushed in a crusher or recycled to the head end of the sag mill. This flow sheet shows a rather complicated looking circuit where the sag mill feed goes through either a crusher, which would be a secondary crusher, or the feed goes over a screen with a particular size fraction being pre-crushed before being fed into the sag circuit. These types of arrangements are, are becoming more common as people move more and more into the bag milling regime because bag mills, it turns out, are not very efficient at using the self-breakage mechanism. And putting these crushers in to help bring down the feed size to a bag mill has found to be quite beneficial. Um, Pre-crushing has some of the problems that are associated with multi-stage crushing plants, so it's going to cost more to put in secondary crushers or pre-crushers. It generates dust, which can be an issue in some places, especially if your, your plant is located near a population center. And you don't want to combine secondary crushing with ag or sag milling where that critical size is what you're making in the secondary crusher. You want to make sure that what's coming out of the crushers augments the breakage in the sag or ag mill and doesn't deliver a whole bunch of unprocessable material into the ag or sag mill. So you must make sure that you're you need to do secondary crushing, for example, if you're in a bag milling situation. And you need to take care to make sure that the size you're feeding into the mill is not the critical size that the mill can't handle. The use of secondary crushers harkens back to uh, older techniques that were used before sag and egg mills were commonly um, used in plants. So an example would be a secondary and tertiary crushing stage feeding a rod mill, which then feeds a ball mill. That would be a, a circuit that existed before sag and ag mills. And the issues with these older circuits, particularly around the crushing stations, um, in the Canadian context, we ran into a lot of problems in wintertime because there, there'll always be a little bit of moisture on that ore as it comes out of the ground. And it can freeze because in Canada, you'd be looking at temperatures of minus 30 degrees Celsius. As soon as a, a damp particle comes from a mine 
and lands on a piece of, of steel uh, lining in a chute, and that liner is at minus 30, well, that rock is going to immediately be frozen to the edge of that liner. Uh, other reasons that people moved into sag milling, particularly when they're dealing with um, hazardous material like asbestos and uranium, is that you don't get a lot of dust generated in a sag mill because it's a wet environment. Crushing plants and screening plants obviously will generate a lot of dust if you're trying to do this crushing and screening dry. Another technology that exists, which I'm not going to talk too much about, is high-pressure grinding rolls. And high-pressure grinding rolls are, you can think of them as a substitute for a tertiary cone crusher, but it's capable of doing much higher tonnages, and it has some beneficial uh, properties to its particle size distribution of the product. And people often tout an HPGR, high-pressure grinding roll, as a direct competitor to a sag mill. Um, one thing that you've got to watch for when people bring you an HPGR design, the HPGR itself does not consume a lot of energy, but it has a lot of ancillary equipment that also consumes power. And the, the power consumed by the conveyors in an HPGR circuit might be equal to the amount of power consumed by the HPGR. In a SAG circuit, the conveyors are, are really negligible, so you, you will generally exclude them from your energy efficiency calculations. But in an HPGR plant or in a crushing and screening plant, you will probably need to include the specific energy associated with the, uh, the conveyors when trying to compare that with a SAG or AG circuit. This is the end of part one of the lecture series. Please click the link in the description area below or subscribe to the channel to pick up the second part of this presentation.